Okay, so today we're going to be talking about GDP, gross domestic product. <clears throat> and um, this is something that uh, most all of us are, are pretty familiar with. And most of you are pretty familiar with this. It's something that the it's uh, it's on a pretty much uh, on a monthly, actually a quarterly basis. We hear the latest and greatest in terms of economic growth, and GDP measures economic growth. GDP stands for again gross domestic product, and typically what we look at is in the chart on the right is that we're looking at percentage changes from the preceding period. In this case, we're looking on an annual basis. Uh, uh, but also the BEA or the Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, they publish uh, this data on a quarterly basis. At any rate, this is uh, an annual look at uh, GDP. And you'll notice in year 2020, we had a negative 3.5%, and that, of course, is uh, wholly attributable to uh, to the COVID experience, right? Uh, prior to that, we were growing at uh, at, at, a, at a, we were growing at least at a positive rate, if you will. At any rate, um, so when we talk about GDP, let's just first we'll talk definitionally. We'll go through defining what GDP is, and again, GDP is gross domestic product, and the definition is the final value of all goods and services at market prices produced in a domestic economy over a given period of time regardless of the producer's country of origin. So in short, GDP is equal to all domestic production, regardless of the firm's home country. So for an example, we look at Honda of America, uh, who has uh, production facilities in many places in the US, but in this case, we'll just say Marysville, Ohio, where they produce um, either the Honda Accord or the Civic or both, I forget. Uh, so that would count toward, uh, toward GDP, whereas <clears throat> Ford, uh, obviously a domestic producer, Ford of Europe, uh, the vehicles that are produced in Europe, production in Germany, for example, of the F-150, uh, that would not um, count toward our GDP, our gross domestic product. Next step down, looking at GNP, uh, GNP is a gross national product, and that also measures the final value of all goods and services produced at market prices. Uh, in a domestic economy by domestic producers uh, over a given period of time again, plus the net income from foreign investments. So we're adding in income receipts from abroad and subtracting uh, income payments going to the rest of the world. So for an hour example, uh, Honda of America, the production of Marysville will count as income payments going, leaving the country in terms of GMP, uh, go, leaving the country and going back to Japan, while Ford of Europe's production would count as income, and uh, the earnings are referred to as being repatriated, brought back into the U.S., if you will. Okay. So, um, so there are two. Just a, kind of as a background on this, when we talk about macroeconomics, uh, we are macro and macroeconomics again, as we've already pointed out, macro focuses on. Uh, three metrics, if you will, in the economy. One would be economic growth, which is the purview, the uh, the area that we talk about in terms of GDP, and that's covered under the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is a depart is a bureau rather under the Department of Commerce. So that's, that's like the executive level, the Department of Commerce, and um, uh, and the other side uh, covering. Uh, areas such as uh, the other the other three of those parts. So one is economic growth, that's the BEA, GDP. Uh, secondly would be the <clears throat> purview, the second and third really would be the purview of the BLS or the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is under the Department of Labor. And they measure such things as um, price level changes, inflation, deflation, and also employment numbers. They, they're the ones that track the employment uh, or the unemployment rate, if you will. And these numbers are tracked on a monthly basis, whereas the BEA tracks their data on a quarterly basis so far as the GDP is concerned. So looking down below at this chart, we are walking from GDP to, down to GNP, and we'll focus on the year 2019. So this would be a, uh, a chart, if you will, a, a graphic coming from the uh, BEA side, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and they have uh, uh, an accounting set up in terms of what's called the national income and product accounts. And so this is where they do all of their tracking through the NIPA or the national income product accounts. They're all available, uh, very easy to find under BEA.gov or for the BLS information, 
uh, you would go to bls.gov and you can drill down and, and see all this data for yourself. It's uh, very, very straightforward. Um, so at any rate, uh, GDP uh, in 2019 came out at $21.4 trillion. So we're adding in uh, the income receipts from the rest of the world to the tune of $1.2 trillion. And we're taking out, remember that uh, uh, Honda of uh, Honda production in America going back to Japan to the tune of $900 billion for all producers, domestic producers that are flowing back to their home countries. And that gets us to this GNP number of $21.7 trillion. Uh, just as a, uh, just, just as a informational point, um, the, the U.S. has typically been pretty, pretty even in terms of GDP and GNP. Um, so this in 2019, it's gone up a little bit, meaning going from GDP to GNP, but they're usually pretty, pretty close. And the reason being is that we have got some balance there, whereas there are other countries that uh, I'm not sure if it's the case now, but for example, like you take like a Germany, Germany has a lot of production overseas, a lot of production for uh, vehicle production for Mercedes and Volkswagen, et cetera, that's done uh, outside of Germany. And so that would uh, typically what would happen then is you would have a higher GNP number than the GDP. Just, that's just as an aside. Okay. So, uh, talking further about GDP and definitionally really is what we're getting at is that when we look at, we can look at GDP in two, two different ways. One in terms of, uh, the finished goods approach and the other would be the value added approach. Uh, finished goods, we're looking at the, uh, product in its totality as it's being delivered to the market. So a new vehicle, a new a new car that's come off fresh off the assembly line with all of its component parts, all those intermediate uh, uh, inter intermediate parts, meaning tires and glass and uh, uh, headlights and so on and so forth, the engine for that matter. These are all combined together, if you will, into that final product, which is that vehicle. So this is the finished good. What is actually being delivered to the customer is what we're talking about. And this is as opposed to the value added approach. And this is um, uh, probably more important in terms of taxes, uh, especially for countries where they have value added taxes. Uh, there's an approach in terms of like categorizing things according to those intermediate goods that go into that final uh, final good or survey good that we're talking about. And anyway, the, these are just two different ways of, of looking at this. And to kind of further clarify this, um, if you take a vehicle, a new vehicle, that is the entire chunk goes into GDP versus say, for example, you want to buy new tires for your car, uh, whereas in the new vehicle, the tires count as part of that, that total. Uh, but if you buy new tires on their own, those would be counted separately in terms of GDP, of course, because you are not buying a new vehicle, you're buying just the new tires, okay? So anyway, there are a lot of positive things that are associated with GDP, of course, we need to uh, keep track of, but there are shortcomings nonetheless. And so what are, what are some of the shortcomings that we're talking about? Uh, first off, it, uh, and this is in no particular order, but this is typical, is that uh, it does not capture home production uh, DIY household chores, etc. So, for example, um, during COVID, a lot of people have embarked upon doing home uh, home activities, home production activities, in terms of uh, uh, household activities, in terms of uh, remodeling uh, kitchens, bathrooms, and so on and so forth. So, the the goods that are purchased, of course, go into GDP. Those uh, fixtures, bathroom fixtures, and uh, kitchen features that were being updated and so on and so forth. But the actual uh, production involved in terms of uh, installing those uh, and doing the, the demolition and so on and so forth, that does not get, get, get counted into GDP. It's what's called imputed. It's, it's, uh, it's production that's done, but it's not recorded, not picked up by GDP. Uh, so that's one, and it's a major portion. There's a lot to do with it, especially when you're talking about typical household chores. Um, uh, that does not does not hit the GDP. Uh, the does not count toward GDP. So also in many countries, especially in high ta higher taxed uh, jurisdictions, higher tax countries, say for example, uh, 
uh, just throw one out there and um, uh, may or may not fit, but I, I'm thinking like a country like Italy, where their taxes are significantly higher than they are in the U.S., uh, there would be an extensive black market or underground activities, and that would also understate GDP because it never rises uh, to the point of actually being cataloged, if you will, under GDP. Um, so the, the, the takeaway from all this is that uh, the big picture-wise, GDP is very important. Uh, but the other aspect of this, so far as the shortcoming is concerned, how does this reflect in terms of the individual? How is the individual within that uh, individual person or individual household within the context of that society? How is that? How does GDP get down to their level? Uh, so the, at, again, at the very highest level, we're looking at those trillions of dollars, and at the next level, we're looking at what's called per capita GDP. Per capita. GDP is, uh, whenever you see per capita, that means per person. So the per person GDP, that's, or the, the GDP rather, that's assigned to uh, each individual, and that would be at $58,113 in the year 2019. Great, so that gives us a, a good number to start with, but there's still more to come. So when we talk about it's nice to have that big number in terms of uh, GDP per person, but how does it really drill down to individuals within the society? So taking it to the next step, so now we're going to one of the sister organizations of, uh, of the Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, and that would be the Census Bureau, which is also under the Commerce Department. So in the Commerce Department, they do various studies, American household and so on and so forth. So we're, uh, in this case, we're trying to derive how much uh, of that income, how much that goes into each of those households. And household is uh, is, is uh, defined as, uh, well, the overall U.S. population is at about 328, well, for 2019, 328 million. It's probably about 330 million, 330 million rather, today in the year 2021. Um, but of the 328 million population, there were 123 households. So 123 households. Households would include uh, people that are living together and under one defined domicile. And there's all kinds of, of, uh, um, uh, of definitions that go along with that. But I think you get the idea, whether we're talking about individual living in a, a home by themselves or an apartment, uh, if we're looking at groups of people, uh, family units, uh, spouses, significant others, uh, roommates, uh, so on and so forth. That is what we refer to as a household. So looking at real median household income. So when we talk about real, and we'll get to this into, uh, into, into this in a little bit, but real, uh, whenever we see real in front of something uh, in economics, we're looking at it in terms of adjusting for inflation. So we're, account, we're, we're accounting for the inflation that would be involved, okay? So what we're saying with this real median household income is that in 1999, that was our high water mark uh, uh, for a number of years. In fact, it was at $62,641 in 1999. Uh, and it took us until 2016 to get past that number. So these, our real median income had fallen over that period of time uh, per household in 2016 had risen to uh, 62,898. But the real, very, very interesting thing is that by 2019, it had gone up by roughly another $6,000 up to uh, 68,703. So this is a good thing. This is a harbinger of, of good things, meaning <clears throat> that what this, what this, what it boils down to is that more people are employed typically and incomes are rising, real incomes are rising. So remember the distinction between real and nominal is real is uh, what that money in your wallet can buy, whereas nominal is the money that's in your wallet. So if, you're, if, if what you can buy is actually increasing, those goods and services that you can purchase with, that, with what's in your wallet, that's a positive thing. So this is a good thing. So now we're drilling down to uh, the household, if you will. So there, to take it another step is that we want to look at another uh, uh, publication from the Census Bureau, and that's the uh, Gini Ratio. And G 
Gini was a was an Italian uh, um, economist, and the objective is to uh, try to see how equal or unequal the income distribution is, how disparate, how uh, how equal or how unequal the income uh, within a, within a given country would be. So in the U.S., for example, in 1970, the Gini ratio was at three point or zero point three nine four. And the, I, the takeaway is that the closer you are to zero, the more equal are the incomes. So 0, 0.00, everyone would have the same exact income. Uh, and again, in 1970, it was at 0 0.394, so there was a fair amount of income disparity. Uh, at any rate, in recent years, it's, it's, it's been much, much higher than that. So the disparity has gone to even higher levels, if you will, going forward. So so the bad news is that by the year 2017, it had gone up to 0 0.489. The good news is that subsequent to 2017, 20, 2018, and 2019, it had fallen. So it was moving in the right direction. So what this means, again, is that going back to this real uh, median household income is that uh, more people are working and uh, uh, the uh, salaries are on the rise. So incomes are improving. So we're getting closer to equal. Point being, again, that equality is never going to happen. We're never going to reach 0, 0.000. However, uh, the closer we move to that, uh, the, the more equal that becomes, the better off that society is. This is something that we aspire to as Americans, and that's, uh, uh, that's, that's kind of, A, it goes without saying, and B, we've made uh, taken steps in terms of uh, in implementing, instituting uh, various taxes, such as uh, like the federal income tax um, as a progressive income tax. The more income that you earn, uh, the more income that you make, the higher your tax rate is going to be, marginal tax rates, et cetera, right? So anyways, we've gone from uh, this GDP number down to drilling down to this uh, this this uh, Gini ratio, if you will. So we're we're fine tuning it quite a bit, but again, this is showing the shortcomings in GDP. So onward, the impact of inflation on GDP. This is what we were referring to already, but uh, real GDP, we're adjusting for inflation. Uh, inflation, again, is defined or price level changes really is what we're saying is the overall weighted average of prices over a given time. Inflation reflects an increase in those overall uh, weighted average of prices over a given time, whereas deflation would be uh, a reduction in overall weighted average prices over a given period of time. Point being, again, that we're adjusting for inflation typically. Um, we have had some deflation, but typically it's more inflation that we're concerned about. So in 2019, that number came in at $19.1 trillion. Uh, the real GDP, whereas the nominal GDP, again, those are your uh, those are your dollars that you have in your wallet, if you will. Uh, 2019, it came in at $21.4 trillion. So uh, a bit higher than the real GDP. <clears throat> real GDP, again, is especially important to individuals and the nation as a whole to determine how quickly the economy is expanding, how fast that expansion is taking place. And the way we can measure this uh, is it's it's called the rule of thumb. This is uh, excuse me the rule of 72, which is a rule of thumb, and we use that to measure uh, growth in anything, whether we're talking about economy or our uh, individual investments. So this is something that you want to pay heed to because this is something that uh, uh, should be near and dear to you so far as like your investments are concerned. The idea behind this or the aim is to see how many years it will take for the economy in this case, to double in size as measured by the GDP. So in this example, the economy is growing at the rate of 3% uh, per year. That would be uh, ideal. We haven't been doing that, but hopefully we'll be getting back to that growth rate going forward. We'll see how things go. Uh, so at 7 at 3% at per year, we take 72, that rule of 72 divided by that 3, the 3%, but just using the 3, uh, equates to 200, or rather 24 years for the economy to double in size. So, for example, if the economy was uh, growing at 4%, 72 divided by 4 is equal to 18 years for the economy to double in size. 
So again, this is a rule of thumb, but it's very, very useful uh, for, for us in, in measuring the economic performance. So taking this the next step, if you will, when we start talking about why things are important, uh, we can look at GDP in terms of, uh, from two different perspectives, if you will. One, we can look at it in terms of expenditures. Uh, uh, so uh, why is it so important for you as an individual or for, or for a country? There's a direct linkage, linkage, if you will, between compensation to employees in this case uh, to and overall national income. <clears throat> so what I mean by that is that the lion's share or 63% of that income that flows back to uh, the households, if you will, uh, comes in the form of compensation to employees, salaries, wages, so on and so forth. So it's a huge, huge chunk of this. Um, and anyways, we'll talk more about this, but just to have that in mind, all of these other categories, and we'll uh, dig into them as we as we go forward to identifying what we mean, but the, the biggest thing to pay attention to is that compensation to employees. This is something that nearly most all of us are concerned with, if you will. So why does the government focus then on nominal GDP? So we're concerned about the real GDP. Government looks at the nominal GDP and that is for taxes. Because once again, when we pay our taxes, uh, what do we pay our taxes with? Nominal dollars. It relates again to the dollars that we have in our wallet. So that's, there are other reasons as well, but that's kind of a simple, uh, uh, kind of an approach to the whole thing is that we are trying to, um, we, we, we have both real and nominal. Nominal, we, we leave that out there. So for primarily for tax reasons, there are others as well, but that's in general what we're talking. Uh, the other way of looking at GDP is in concern in terms of, of consumption. So looking at nominal dollars again, uh, the gross domestic product for 2019 was at $21.4 trillion. And the other um, parts of this consumption or where this consumption went, one was to personal consumption expenditures uh, at about typically about 70%. I think this is about 67, 68%. Um, and uh, so that's going back to the household in terms of things that we buy, consumer purchases. That's why we say the consumer is the most important part of, of the economy. And they are 70%. We are, I should say. We're all consumers. Uh, gross private domestic investment, that would be the firms buying things like uh, uh, you know, robots and trucks and other capital equipment that will be going back into the firm, if you will. Um, and uh, the, the the next one is uh, net exports, but let's go to uh, government consumption expenditures and gross investment. And that would include anything that the government buys in terms of pencils and papers all the way out to aircraft carriers, etc. The last item would be net exports of goods and services. And uh, it's a funny way of looking at it, but what we're doing is we're taking exports minus imports. Exports are adding to the economy, imports are taking away. So we're netting those out and come up to net exports of goods and services. And of course we have a negative number. In this case, in 2019, it was $611 billion negative. That means that we, were, we had a trade deficit, which we've had for the last 30 plus years, a trade running trade deficits. Anyhow, so that's on the consumption side. So we're looking at two different sides again, the same coin. Um, so we're gonna take a look at the drilling down again on that consumption expenditure piece. We're looking at the circular flow of real economic activity. So on the consumption side, we're, we start with PCE. So that's on the top, that inner circle with the output mix, goods and services, that's also that uh, personal consumption expenditures flowing from the firm to the household. Uh, and whereas the other non-consumption uh, activities, if you will, are spending or, or they're called injections as well, uh, would include such things as that gross private domestic investment, adding things to the firm, whether we're talking about robots or uh, vehicles, et cetera. Um, next, we're looking at that net exports where we're taking exports less imports and uh, finally, that government consumption expenditures or gross investment, government spending, 
on, again, such things, anything from pencils and paper to uh, aircraft carriers, right? That's that gross investment side. Hopefully it'll last a long, long time, right? Anyway, the other part of this, another way of looking at GDP, if you will, would be from the exp taking the expenditure approach. So we're looking first and foremost at what? Compensation to labor, that's 68, 70% of, of that chunk, uh, or excuse me, 63%, Goes to goes to labor, compensating our labor. Uh, the other these are remember these are all flowing back where <clears throat> to the household as owners of those productive resources. Compensation to labor, interest would be paid for uh, uh, would would be paid for investments, etc. Um, profit to uh, profit itself. The concept of profit flowing back to it flows back to. Uh, uh, labor in terms of profit sharing, if you have profit sharing, the owners of the of the firm in terms of uh, that physical capital, underlying financial capital is what we're referring to, is uh, are the dividends or that would be like on an annual basis. Capital gains would be the increase in the uh, share, if you will, of your of of your of, of the stock price. Uh, the increase in stock prices are reflected in capital gains. And um, lastly, in terms of profit, would be entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are compensated. They can be compensated as labor, but typically they're also compensated as in their entrepreneurial function in terms of stock options or bonuses or whatnot. Uh, and lastly, it would be uh, uh, would be would be rent, and uh, the rent would be again uh, paid for uh, uh, paid back to the owners of that of of the property in terms of uh, the productive resource land, right? So back to when we were talking about, just to kind of get our heads wrapped around this is again, when we're moving from GDP to GNP to national income, national income is what we use to, uh, when, we, when we talk about the expenditure approach, when we talk about the compensation to employees on the right hand side, et cetera. So the major difference between, again, GDP to GNP, we've talked through, talked about that before, but going from GNP to national income, the, there's another step in net national product, but basically it's national income. Uh, we're taught, we, we, the, the difference is depreciation or the accounting, if you will, for the consumption of fixed capital. And very, very briefly here, what the way we get from that GNP to that national income uh, by accounting why we have to account for depreciation, it's it's actually pretty straightforward. Because if as as well people know, if you have if you if if you buy a um, this is an accounting um, exercise, really very brief, but just a quick overview. If you buy some buy and say you buy a new truck for your business, and the truck costs uh, fifty thousand dollars, and over the core, it's going to last you five years. You're going to be using it for five years. And over that five year period, what are you doing? You're using up that vehicle, you're using up that truck. And that's where that depreciation piece comes in. It's using up that useful asset over its life. Anyways, this is the move toward national income and the breakout of national income is on the right, um, where we see a compensation to employees to, to a 63%. Uh, small businesses and corporate, uh, and corporations, uh, this, these are all profits flowing through to them. Rent going back for land, interest, of course, being paid to uh, debt owners of companies and debt owners, debt, 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 people that are lending money, if you will, the household. Taxes on production and imports, this is something that uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a large chunk, but it's, it's something where there is a decision made where this was going to flow and if they, it was decided to flow through to production imports and it's something that is, is just out there and it's, it's worth discussing, but not at this time. Uh, subsidies, transfer payment and current surplus of government. This is, uh, this is the, if you will, the national income breakup. So kind of to wrap things up on uh, gross domestic product. Again, on the right, we have our, our image of, of how we typically see uh, changes in real uh, GDP, how it's cataloged, if you will, by um, by the BEA, by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. But so on a national level, GDP is a very important component, but one of many of those 
macro uh, metrics that we use in determining the health of the economy. Uh, GDP is measured again by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which falls under the aegis of the Department of Commerce. Um, and unemployment rates are the big three, if you will, GDP, uh, employment, and uh, price level changes. The unemployment rate, or the U3, UR rate, is the one we typically see on a monthly basis published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics under the uh, Department of Labor. Uh, likewise, the uh, CPI, or the uh, the measure of, of uh, price level changes is also categorized or cataloged, if you will, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, again, under the Department of Labor. So with all these tools that we have to employ, <coughs> um, that, we employ that we have to measure such things as GDP and unemployment and CPI, it's, it's very, very important to understand that these are estimates at the end of the day. Um, and it's, they're, they're good estimates in terms of we don't have anything else that we can really turn to to get a better idea. So these are the, these are the, the, the this is the playbook, the hymn book that everyone has to follow. So like it or not, these are the numbers that we have to deal with. And they're, they're, not, they're not terrible, I'll leave it at that. So like on a personal level, again, uh, having a great uh, personal level meaning for all of us, it's a very, it's an important, uh, having a basic grasp of GDP is very important. So keeping in mind that GDP and national income uh, are closely linked at, uh, uh, closely linked at about 60% uh, takes the form of that compensation for our labor. Likewise, on the consumption side, um, that uh, our personal consumption expenditures account for close to 70% of that GDP. So. Anyways, in both cases, the measure of GDP in terms of uh, individual or personal level is based on the real change over a period of time. Again, the real GDP we're talking about. And referring back to the rule of 72, the takeaway from this is the faster the rate of growth, the quicker you double the economy, the quicker you double your investment, plain and simple.